Kibro, would you yeah. like to, to start? Uh, I think it's nine. Yeah, we can we can start. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, uh, depending on when where you are. My name is Kibro Mabai. I'm a research fellow uh, at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Again, uh, uh, welcome to the seminar. Uh, this is a seminar series on focusing on uh, development economics research skills. Um, this is a seminar series uh, being organized by uh, PEP Research Fellows. Uh, this is the last seminar that, uh, that we are having for the season, but we will have another, uh, we'll be starting uh, the next season soon uh, in September and uh, I encourage you to stay tuned uh, and uh, keep on joining us. Uh, our today's speaker is Anna uh, Kasuf. Anna is a, pro a professor in uh, in the Department of Economics at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She obtained her PhD in Applied Economics from the University of Minnesota. She had held uh, postdoctoral positions at the London School of Economics as well as at the University of Minnesota. And she has also served as a consultant for uh, several international organizations, including uh, the ILO uh, and the World Bank. Uh, Anna is going to talk about uh, child labor and uh, cause and consequence, uh, an important agenda to, uh, to the contemporary uh, policy. Anna, you're welcome, uh, and thank you uh, uh, for, for uh, this speech, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Kibro. Uh, thank you all. Welcome to this webinar. I would like to thank uh, Pep for launching this important development economic series of webinars. And today I would like to give you a broad view of some concepts uh, related to child labor. So I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the history of child labor, uh, some definitions, statistics, uh, an idea of a theoretical model, causes and consequences of these problems, and some policies related to mitigate uh, child labor and the COVID crisis, how it's going to affect child labor. Um, 
it's interesting that studies related to child labor, they are not recent in the literature. Although child labor existed long before the Industrial Revolution, uh, its incidence has aggravated during this time. The ideas of earlier writers such as Karl Marx, Alfred Marshall, and Arthur Pigo, among others, contribute to the development of our contemporary mathematical and theoretical models related to child labor. So, for example, Marx in 1867, he talked a lot and wrote about child labor in factories. And he, he discussed that the advent of machinery decreased labor time. Decreasing labor time, the wages and family income also decreased. And that resulted in the entire family members working. So uh, children, women that before was not common to see working, start working uh, because the machinery permit, uh, they didn't need so much strength, human strength, and also because they needed extra income. Uh, Marshall in 1920 also uh, talked about child labor in the Industrial Revolution and show how much increased the problem at this time. And it's interesting that he showed the importance of investing in human capital and how schooling and parents' incentives were important for, uh, for children and for their development. Also, Pigo in 1932 talked about the eradication of child labor, but at the same time, he was aware of problems of aggravating poverty for those families that were below subsistence level and always defend some public social policies to help poor, poor families. After uh, the problems involving child labor were largely discussed among the 19th century writers, uh, the topic was neglected by economists during a long period of time. Uh, why is that? This, this, this topic stopped being discussed by economists and only reappears around 1995. Uh, it's interesting that at the same time, there were a lot of research uh, on, on mainly by Robert Barrow, but also others showing that development economics, it was very related to the accumulation of human capital. So uh, growing was reached if you had a reduction of poverty and if uh, schooling were uh, high level and, and many kids were in school and, and there were high technology and things like that. And due to that, uh, child labor was seen as an impediment to economic progress. So then economists start being aware of the problem. Besides that, there was an increase in the availability of high quality microdata. Uh, because before we didn't have much computer, technology, softwares, hardwares to, 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 to measure child labor. With these uh, household surveys and others, other surveys uh, using microdata, it was much easier to, to calculate, to find the impact of child labor on many, many issues. Uh, what is child labor? That's a very polemic uh, topic. We can say that all work performed by children should be called child labor and should be eliminated. Actually, no, there is a big discussion on this issue. Uh, some people think that uh, working is good if they, the work doesn't interfere with schooling, uh, if it doesn't cause any damage to the child, it could actually bring some skills, some experience, and some responsibility. So the ILO, the International Labor Organization, defines child labor as the work that deprives children of their childhood, their potential, their dignity, and that's harmful to physical, mental development, uh, and interferes with schooling. 
In this case, they call child labor and they differentiate between child labor and child work. Child work would be something acceptable if uh, it's in the in an age level, not uh, not very very young. If the the children had like more than fourteen years old and so on. Also, there is the worst forms of child labor. So we, we think about all the illicit activities: is slavery trafficking. Uh, uh, slavery trafficking, debt bondage, sexual exploitation, drug trafficking, and armed conflicts. These are very complicated uh, activities because it's very hard to measure. People don't say they are in these activities, of course, because it's not allowed. And the hazards. The hazards is, uh, by ILO is, are the activities that are like to harm the health, safety, and moral of the child. So uh, there was just now they released, ILO and UNICEF released a report showing there are, there are six, 160 million working children from five to 15, 17 years old in the world. And almost half are in hazardous work. So in this table, we see that the big problem is in Sub-Saharan Africa where uh, one in every five child works. There are eight, seven million children working. Uh, and then Asia also, it's a big problem. And some in Latin America. So these are mainly in the world, these are the, the, the regions with the largest uh, number and percentage of children working in the world. And here uh, we can see that through the years, there was a decline. So uh, from 2000 here, but we can notice this decline since the 90s where the data start being collected. We see that there is a trend of decline in, in the number and the percentage of children working and in hazardous activities. But unfortunately, they just noticed that from 2016 to 2000, the last four years, there was a stagnation. So the percentage um, is the same, and, but the number in absolute terms actually increased in the last uh, four years. And the main problems uh, uh, are showing in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the main increase in number of children. Uh, I would like now to tell you, uh, give you a notion of, um, of a theoretical model. I will not go through equations or anything, but uh, I just talk about some very base uh, model, which is developed by Bazou and Van and discussed by Bazou, it is an Atos. And the, the main assumptions behind this model is the luxury and the substitution axiom. The luxury axiom says that family will send the cho their children to work only if family income drops below subsistence level. And I'm calling here S, subsistence level. That means that leisure and school time are luxury goods. So the idea is that the parents, they are altruistic. They don't want to send their children to work. They only do that because they really need, they really need income. Otherwise they would starve, they would die. Uh, the other assumption is the substitution axiom that says that adult labor and child labor are substitutes subject to an adult equivalence correction that we call gamma. So this is interesting because uh, some time ago, people are, used to say that there were some activities that only kids could do. And they would call that nimble fingers. So like the, the, the child has a small hand, a small fingers uh, that uh, they, they, only they could like hand knotted carpets, work in this industry. Other people could not do that, but that's not true. There were some papers, uh, the first one was by Labson and others in 98, that studied really deeply the industry of hand-knotted carpets and show uh, that this didn't happen. That was in India, actually. 
So there are now many different researches uh, showing that the luxury axiom and the substitution axiom actually uh, works very well. Uh, the adult wage I'm calling here W, and it's uh, assumed that the, 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 the adult supply one unit of labor in a full day. And the child labor I'm calling here WC and child supply gamma unit of labor in a full day. So we have that gamma W is equal to uh, WC. So the wage of the child is like uh, this equivalent a correction gamma times the wage of the adult. So this framework helps understand why children work. Uh, and poverty is a very important uh, 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 variable to explain child labor supply. In this figure here, it's very clear to understand a lot what we are going to talk in the future. Let's assume that there are N families, capital N families, and in, this, in each family, I have one adult and M children. So we can see here that the adult wage is represented uh, on the vertical axis, okay? If this wage is greater than S, S is our subsistence level. If the wage is greater than S, only adults supply their labor. So we are here. And we are assuming for simplicity that the supply is perfect in elastic. Then this AB is part of our labor supply. As W, as the wage drops below the subsistence level, below S, children are sent to work in an effort to reach the target acceptable level of income. So remember, uh, parents are altruistic. They just send their kids because they really need income. So as the wage drops further below the subsistence level, total labor supply uh, increases. So we, we are uh, starting to go to the right here. And labor supply, which is the axis, is starting increasing. So more kids working and adults working. This continues until there is no further labor to supply. And then we are back to uh, 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 a curve, supply curve that's perfect in elastic. So the, the, the curve ABCF is our supply curve. If we think of a standard downward sloping demand curve for labor, then we have two stable equilibrium, A1 and uh, E1 and E2. At E1, which is this point here, um, we have uh, wages above the, the subsistence level and only adults are working, okay? So uh, at A E1, we say it's a good equilibrium. Only adults work, there is no child labor. On the other hand, at E2, the wages are low and there is high incidence of child labor. So we are here and that's called a bad equilibrium. Uh, observe that in a, uh, in a very poor economy, it's entirely possible that the demand for labor is so low that the only intersection could be at E2. And, and in that case, uh, if we ban child labor, it could be worse because uh, this, the family would not reach subsistence level. However, if we are in a situation like this one, we could ban child labor if they were in, in, in equilibrium E2 and the economy goes to equilibrium E1, which is good without child labor. So this uh, theoretical model helped a lot to understand how uh, this economy works how child labor works. So I would like now to talk about these causes of child labor. What are the factors contributing for a child to work? 
And here I'm talking about economic and family aspects. I'm not going to talk about other issues like social norms and things like that. Poverty. So the first thing everybody remembers and think about is poverty. It's known that lower income countries are likely to have higher rates of child labor. So uh, cross country data show negative correlation between GDP per capita and children working. Uh, this picture here shows this very clearly. The colors are the regions and the size of the bubbles are the size of the, the number of children in the country. Uh, the purple is Africa. So we see here uh, in the axis GDP per capita and in the Y axis we have the percentage of children working. Observe that the poor countries like low GDP per capita have high incidence of child labor, Guinea-Bissau, Cameroon, Sierra Leone, Niger, and other countries. When you have like a larger GDP per capita, we have a lower incidence of child labor. Uh, Argentina, Chile is here. So this is not uh, to show causality, but it's, indication. it's an indication that uh, higher income, lower child labor. There were some papers also showing that, one by Edmond in Vietnam, there were papers in India showing that when the country increased their GDP, the incidence of child labor decreased a lot. At household level, it's not so easy to relate child labor and income. Uh, why is that? Because usually surveys do not measure supply of child labor, but they, they measure incidence of child labor, which depends on the demand. And uh, demand is complicated because we, we have a lot of children in poor countries working in their own farm, in their own household, and, and it's, it's difficult to differentiate demand and supply in this case. Uh, also, studies use mainly cross-sectional data. It's hard to, to see panel data in, in poor countries, which could help uh, to isolate effects if we had panel data. When comparing poor households to rich households, uh, there are many unobserved factors that are associated with child labor, like parents and children's motivation, child ability, uh, and many others that are hard to control and not measurable. There is also measurement error in variables because uh, usually in household surveys, who respond the questionnaire is the parents, like the mother or the father, never the child. And we don't know, but many times children's response would be different than parents' response in terms of child labor. Also endogeneity problems, those that are acquainted with econometrics know that this is a big problem. Uh, is poverty causing child labor or is child labor causing poverty? Um, so here we have some studies that uh, try to measure the impact of poverty on child labor. And we see that there is a lot of variation. For example, this one in Nepal, Peru, and Zimbabwe, they found that poverty would uh, increase poverty, child labor, but only in rural areas, not in urban areas. There is a classical paper by Balotra and Hedy that they use uh, surveys from rural Pakistan and Ghana and show that children of land-rich households were more likely to work than children of land poor households. So since land is related to wealth, they say, well, so if you are rich, you are using more child labor, how is this? So they call this wealth paradox. And the, and the reason for that is the market imperfections. With, with lots of land or with higher land in the household would be more, uh, the, the parents, would have greater opportunity to use their own labor and would be more productive. So then they use child labor. So it's very complicated, as you can see, to isolate those effects. Besides poverty, 
they have credit constraint. Of course, poor households are usually more likely to be credit constrained. And several studies try to analyze the effect of this credit constraint on child labor and schooling, consider the link between uh, children working and economic shocks. What are the economic shocks? Unemployment, crop failures, usually some problems in the meteorology that uh, a lot of rain or droughts and, and then uh, it's, it's easy to show that children start working more because of that. I, I cited one paper here when they show that unemployment in the males had increased children's work. Also, uh, if a parent is, uh, if you have a single mother, for example, in a household, we would see more uh, children working because usually they have to fill uh, the, the, the work of other parents, income decrease, and uh, there is a lot of family income variation and a higher necessity of child labor. Uh, there is a paper in the US by Mohelin showing that leaving a part of one or both parents were associated with lower school attendance and greater market work participation. Birth order is another important variable uh, to, that cause child labor. It's very easy to show that uh, an older uh, uh, sister uh, usually works a lot in the household. It's associated with household chores. And the, the older brother usually go to the market labor. And the younger ones, the younger siblings, actually go to school and, uh, and study. So uh, there is a burden in the older brothers to, to work, uh, to have to get income and for the youngers to study. There are many different papers showing that this one I cited is in Nepal. Older boys and girls are more likely to work and less likely to study. One very important uh, variable also is parents' education. It's very clear that if you have parents with higher education, the probability that their kids do not work and go to school is higher for parents with higher education. Um, and mainly mother's education, more than father's education, this impact is higher. Uh, this paper by Rosati Tizanatos observed that in Vietnamese children the, with more educated parents have lower probability to work full-time uh, than uh, less educated parents. Another variable that's related with uh, social norms and cultural norms is if the parents work as a child. It's common to, to, to hear parents saying, oh, I did work, why my, my kids cannot work? And so if you, if you look that, you measure that, uh, you, you actually see it's true. If parents work as a child, the probability that their kids work as a child is higher than if parents uh, work later in life. And there are some papers here showing that in Egypt and in Brazil. Okay, so these are the main causes of child labor. Of course, there are others, but these are the main. But what are the consequences? If the kids start really early in life working, what would cause, what are the implications? Mainly, we observe that those children have lower school attainment if they start working early. They have worse performance in school. They have a reduction in wages later in life and they have house damage. So due to difficulty in isolating the effect, the studies use time difference between the observed adults or older children and the occurrence of child labor. Also, some studies use instrumental variables to avoid endogeneity. 
So it's complicated to isolate the effect because first schooling and labor is, uh, is a one uh, decision uh, because you, saw, you know, time is constrained or a child has leisure or a child study or a child goes to school. So the models have one decision and, and it's very hard to isolate the effect. So what we do here is we use a survey that right now ask a person, the adult, have you worked as a child when you were young? And then we use these variables to, uh, to connect with what happened today. When we don't have panel, of course. So here's some studies showing uh, in Vietnam, for example, they use a, a panel data and they analyze the impact of child labor on education, wages, and health. And they observe that for each addi additional hour of child work, there is a decrease in the probability of attending school and in completing school five years later. Also, uh, using data from Brazil, they show that starting to work before 13 years old results in a reduction of 13 to 17% in wages when adults are compared to those who, who started working uh, at older age. So see, we, we see here how, what happened to adults when they start working earlier. There is a paper that I wrote uh, that show a negative effect of child labor on earnings in adult life in Brazil. And, um, and also there is a recent paper that we look at not only work in the labor market, but also household chores, which is a, a very polemic issue as well, uh, because they say, oh, uh, usually the, the surveys do not collect data on household chores. They, they, they do not consider that as a, child, as a work. And it's very important because kids sometimes work for a long period inside their households, cleaning, taking care of smaller uh, siblings, brothers and sisters, uh, or, or cooking. And they, even if they study, because in some countries they have like shifts of school, schools in the morning, schools in the afternoon, schools at night. So that allow kids to study, to go to school and to work, even when they work, their performance in school is lower. So we show that, that kids that even if they only do household chores, their performance in school are lower. And if they do market labor is even worse. So why? Because they are tired, because they, they don't do homework, they don't have time for that, they, they don't perform well in school. Um, also, children may suffer physical injuries at work, resulting in health problems, not only during childhood, but in adult life. They may suffer psychological stress, and that perpetuates through their whole life. We also show that Brazilian adults that started early in life working had worse self-reported health status. So, uh, seeing all of that, what are the policies that could help to mitigate the problem? A first one is the awareness campaign. If we look at uh, 20, 30 years ago, people like parents were proud of saying, oh, my kids work. Today, they, they are embarrassed of saying my kids work because it's a, there was a change, there was uh, an awareness campaign uh, showing that child labor is not good and kids should be in school. This is a change of cultural norms and it's very important. Also, if we think that parents are altruistic as in the model, uh, then if the adult labor market works well, if the unemployment falls, if income rises, then automatically children will be out of the labor force. Another thing that's very important is improving school quality. 
uh, school uh, attracts kids when they, they see the return to investment or the, the parents see the returns to investment. So it's very good to have a high quality school for the improvement of, uh, of the, the, the human capital of kids and decrease of child labor. Another policy that was have a, had a high impact was the conditional cash transfer programs. Uh, I think everybody heard about those programs. They provide income to poor families, condition on school children being enrolled and attending school. Also, they have like pregnant and breastfeeding women going to prenatal and postnatal health care and small children being vaccinated. This, uh, this conditional cash transfer, an example of the biggest ones in the world are the Mexico, Prospera now, it was Oportunidad before, and Brazil, Bolsa Familia. In Brazil, for example, one fourth of the population received this this program is like uh, 50 million people. And, and it's very good because the cost is very low. So the family do not, families do not receive a, a large amount, but the amount they receive have high impact. So kids decrease the amount of crazy in child labor, the uh, increase schooling, and since the schooling compete with child labor, decrease the number of hours working if they don't get out of work, at least decrease the number of hours. So it's very, it's a very good the way of uh, dealing with child labor and schooling. Anna, you have a maximum of five minutes or four minutes. It would be great. Thank you. you yeah. Sure, I'm finishing. Thank you, Kibro. So here there are some papers showing um, the, the impact of those conditional cash transfer, transfer programs uh, in Brazil, in Bangladesh, in Mexico, in Ecuador, many others showing that they decrease child labor and improve schooling. Uh, also, every country has uh, uh, laws or almost every country have laws uh, prohibiting child labor, but some are not enforced. The international conventions, we have ILO Convention 138 and ILO 182 that uh, want to restrict the age of children employed and the other that eliminate the hazard, the worst forms of child labor. And there are many countries had ratifying this, uh, the, these conventions. Also, trade sanctions. Developed countries have called for trade sanctions and, and consumer boycotts of products made with child labor when developing countries have high levels of child labor. Uh, so they have labels saying, oh, this is free of child labor. You can consume, otherwise do not consume that product. And some examples that were in the media a lot were hand knotted rugs in Nepal, soccer balls in Pakistan, and garment industry in Bangladesh. Uh, you see that the theoretical models indicate that that could even aggravate the problem if the wage received by children help families meet subsistence levels. So we should be careful. Also, the sanctions could be a form of hidden protectionism and not directed to children well-being. So uh, the country do not want to buy the product and so has an excuse for that. So finally, I would like to talk about what about COVID? What is this going to affect children working in schooling? Of course, uh, with the COVID problems, um, we expect millions of children going to child labor. Why? Because pandemic increased the number of children in income poor household. So families suffer a lot, job loss, income loss, uh, there were cut off remittances. And some of the research available right now at this period of the pandemic is showing that in Ecuador, more than a one third rise in child labor. Sao Paulo city, there is a research by UNICEF showing almost 30% increase in child labor. In Egypt, many children were sent to work in cotton cultivation. Ivory Coast in cocoa business, Burkina Faso in granite mining. So we already see data showing the increase in child labor. 
Another problem that aggravates a lot is the school closure during the, the, the lockdowns. So it's very difficult. Families see the kids, they are not in school, they are doing nothing, they need money, so they go to, to work. It's very important to mitigate this problem, the social protection coverage, the, the social programs like the conditional cash transfer and other programs, and incentives for children to go back to schools. Thank you so much. I, I left my email here. If you want to uh, email, talk to me, send questions, I will answer some questions now if you have, and also uh, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. I think this is uh, great, and you have covered a lot of interesting material, and uh, yeah, I, I think this is very exciting um we have got some questions from uh audience um so uh i can uh yeah okay uh let me see if i can try to uh allow uh, people to speak uh so uh so far we have got uh several questions so i'll i'll be uh yeah i'll try to we'll try to address uh uh, all of them, but if we are not able to address them, uh, please uh, try to reach out to Anna or uh, 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 yeah, so that she can answer the questions. So and let me uh, probably Kibron, you can uh, see uh, similar topics and make like you know I I can answer like many different many many questions at the same time. Otherwise, we not have time for all of them. Yeah, very good. Um, so i i think it might be better if i allow people to speak uh i don't think kibro probably should read because otherwise it will take more longer do you okay, great. To... yeah let me okay let, let me let me do that let me start from uh, ariane's question uh so let me read it uh thank you so much anna so interesting and important um two questions uh first any insights on gender differences both at parent and child level Second, is there any data that allows us to understand how much kids work rather than as a binary variable? This, I think, is critical uh, analytically, but also for policy purpose um, here, here in, in North America. Yeah, I think that's, uh, these are the questions from my end. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, gender is it's very important in this topic. Uh, it's very different. We see women, uh, girls working mainly in the household tasks, uh, not only their own household, but as uh, in, a, in, a, in another household. They, they get salaries to work, like performing household chores. And uh, boys are more uh, dealing with the labor market, uh, agricultural uh, market. That's the main sector of work uh, so it's very different it, it, as i said uh, if we have siblings the girl would stay home and do household chores the boys would go to the labor market so it's important to differentiate uh, the number of hours uh, working is very important so we have sometimes how many hours a child spend working uh, in, in some surveys instead of only work or not. This is very important. As I said, if you, if you look at the impact of conditional transfer, cash transfer programs on child labor, sometimes you don't see a reduction of labor, but you see a reduction in the number of hours that those uh, kids uh, uh, work because they, if they study more, they work less. So that's very important to have number of hours. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thanks. Um, let me proceed to the next question. Uh, that's from Chairpost Maada. Maada. So he's saying you have mentioned that improving the quality of education can reduce the level of child labor, while access to education is also a major cause of child labor in, in most developed countries. Uh, I, he's saying, I can also see that many of the causes of child labor are interwined each, with each other uh, and any attempt. Can you, yeah, I think he's asking if there is any attempt made to look at the interactions of the cause of child labor. 
Um, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So it's true. It's very hard to disentangle, to distinguish those things because uh, we can say uh, it, child labor work, uh, children works, and the children work, and then that affects schooling, or they don't want to study, they don't like to study, and that's they go to the labor market and they work. So there is endogeneity here, very, very hard to disentangle these things. Um, and, and you're right. So if the we have the same problem in Brazil, if the schools are not good, if the schools are are not teaching much, they don't. They, they, the kids are not learning much. Uh, they, there is no incentive to go to school. That's the main problem. We need to have schools that it has a, a way of showing that they will have a better future. So parents have an incentive to put their kids in school and not in, in, in labor and, and not put their, their children working because they would see in the future that uh, that would be a good investment. They would have a better job. They would have a higher wage. They would get out of the poverty trap, which is very common to observe in poor families. The, the father work, the father is poor. They cannot survive without children working. So children work a lot. They don't go to school. They don't foresee the, the investment in schools and, and, and how they can be better off in the future. So the kids also are poor. They cannot improve. They cannot get a good job. That circle, that poverty trap is really difficult to be out. Very good. Uh, yeah, there are other questions. Uh, there is a, yeah, uh, there is another question from Jen. Um, uh, let me read it. Uh, Excellent presentation, Anna. Uh, indeed, it is worrisome uh, what might happen to child labor due to COVID-19, especially in low-income and fragile countries uh, where child labor has always been a problem. I think this is uh, an area that needs a lot of research uh, so as to inform post-COVID recovery options and policies. I, yeah, I think it's more of a, a comment and I, I would uh, definitely take that at, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, a comment that that we can or you can yeah well, yeah it's true covid is going to make things a lot worse because mainly our informal jobs uh, in poor countries we see a large percentage of people working in informal labor uh, and because of lockdown this was completely upside down so parents cannot get money kids are 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 out of school and then that's the the, the scenario for working and getting money somehow. So the situation is critical. And also when they get out of school and they, they spend like a year without schooling, many, many poor kids don't have internet or things like that to have courses in distance. Uh, they would not go back. You know, it's hard to, for the kids to go back to school. And so we'll need a lot of policies to try to, to improve and, and to mitigate this problem. Yeah, just to follow up to that, but is there any evidence so far on that? Uh, I mean, because there are several phone surveys in, uh, in, in some parts of, I think, for instance, in, in uh, several African countries, but I don't know if they cover any, any of that, but it would be interesting if, to see if there had been some evidence already. Yeah, uh, yeah I cited some uh, that is already, uh, uh, the surveys already uh, measured in, in the pandemic period, uh, increases of 30% in child labor, which is a lot. So we still we need more, more research and more data, but is, the, the indication is that it's going to be a big problem. I saw here that somebody mentioned the sustainable development goal. Uh, there is a, a 8.7 uh, related to slavery and, and and child labor that should be banned. Just responding one question here. Very good. Um, there is also another question from Lucas. Um, let me read it. Uh, thanks, Anna. Adult informal workers do not have workers' compensation. Any evidence of how this affects child labor? 
uh, the uh, sorry the the labor compensation you said Kibron so he's saying that uh, informal workers do not have either yeah. insurance or work workers compensation and he's asking if there is yes. any evidence uh, uh, showing okay. the impact of lack of insurance okay okay thank you yeah yeah exactly Lucas because um, that that is related with those uh, shocks that I mentioned, the credit constraint, uh, since the parents are unemployed or have any like uh, crop uh, problems, uh, some disaster, now climate change, all these shocks would affect uh, child labor because they don't have uh, unemployment insurance, they don't have any, any help from, from because it's informal labor. They don't have health insurance. They don't have anything. So this is the big, big issue because uh, the, the kids are, are going to work somehow, uh, even in the streets and in bad conditions to, to help families not starve. Very good. Um, let me add one more question and then I'll, I'll have my own question. Uh, so yeah. Zaid uh, is asking, is the is government's role more likely towards eradicating child labor or converse like if we see some poor countries like they want high economic growth? I think he's highlighted, he, he wants you to reflect on the trade-off. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, we, we can see that it's very difficult, the surveys, uh, that's what I said, the surveys uh, report what the parents respond. Uh, that's one problem. Uh, countries also do, do not want to show data. Uh, many surveys do not collect data for kids below 14. And there are many kids working at the age of six, seven, eight. Uh, but they, that question is not even in the survey. So they just, oh, if you have 14 years old or more, you respond. Otherwise, you don't respond the questionnaire. Uh, so it's true. Um, it, it's a big issue. Uh, we have to, to be aware of different tasks like household chores, children working 30, 40 hours per week, uh, taking care of kids, taking care of disabled people, taking care of cooking, cleaning, that they don't have time for, for studying, for playing, for leisure. And yes, many countries, many countries uh, do not show information. Very good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have one more question. Um, so, uh, in terms of measurement, I don't know what, what's the best practice to collect this data. Is, is it, which one is, I mean, should we be asking uh, the parents, the parents about uh, um, the participation of the, their children in economic activities or mainly the, the, the children themselves? Like what is the, the, the discourse in this setting? I think, bro, uh, we should have a different level collection of data. For example, community data, parents' data, uh, kids' data, and, and try to compare uh, the responses because it's not easy to, to get information um and and that's that's one problem also panel data helps a lot and it's rarely found in poor countries but uh, you, we we the best option in my point of view is to have different levels and then compare i see i see very good um Do we have, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, we have got one more question. Um, hi, Anna, uh, think, thanks for your presentation. This is a, a great presentation. Uh, in resource, resource constrained countries, especially in Africa, where poverty, poor education and unemployment are so high, what interventions can, can be prioritized to end child labor? Yeah, see, uh, the problem is that uh, child labor is not an easy issue. 
as we could uh, have a glance here in this seminar, there are many, many variables affecting child labor. So there is not a single policy that say, oh, do that, that would solve the problem. Uh, actually, you know, many things are coming and, and many policies are, are being used and, and child labor is, is not decreasing as much as we would expect and it's, it's not over. So, I mean, we, we are not going to eradicate, you know, this is impossible, but we would like to have a very small number of kids working, that's not true. So it's a mix of policies. Uh, if you see families that have a cultural norm that says, oh, you know, work is good. My kids are going to work because they are going to acquire experience, responsibility. Uh, that's cultural. Then they need an awareness campaign. If you see that uh, people are starving, families cannot survive without children's income, then Social programs are very important. You need to give income to those poor families. Otherwise, the kids will not stop working. Otherwise, if they stop working, they would be another problem. They would die starving or something like that. And they could even go to worse uh, activities like illicit activities. That, that's another very big issue that we don't even measure well this kind of activity. So it's a big mixture. You know, there is no single answer, no single policy. Thanks, thanks, Anna. Mm, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think these are all the questions we had. Um, Good. Yeah, my email is there. So if you guys need anything, please contact me. I'll be, I'll be happy to, to respond and to help if I can. Uh, we have got one more question. Um, and that's from Ariane. Uh, I'm going to read it. On the policy question, uh, it doesn't seem that the quality of education would be the number one priority, post-COVID in particular. Do uh, you want to reflect on that? Yeah, could be, you know, but it's not easy. Huh? Also, if, if you study economics of education, you see how difficult it is to say, what are the variables responsible for improving the quality of education? You know, so many countries uh, could uh, increase the proportion of children in school. Many countries have like now a large percentage of children in school, but the quality of education is still very low. And what to do, you know, how to improve the quality of education, uh, putting good textbooks, changing curriculum, including technology and computers, uh, investing in teachers, qualification, there is no single question for that. So it's true, if you have a good schooling, if you attract kids, uh, you could improve child labor, but how to do that? I feel in education now, it's very, very complicated because we have a world with a high technology, we have kids playing with uh, cell phone, computer games, three dimensions, color. But if you go to school, you see this blackboard the same way as 40 years ago or more, you know? And the professor, the teachers many times, they, are, they don't know, they don't have the skills to, to use technology. So we are in a transition that is very complicated. The kids want to see things they see in the, the cell phone, in the, in the computer, and they don't want something boring in the, in the old style, blackboards in the, in the schools. But that's what exists. So OK, OK. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And uh, I think we are running out of time now. Um, thank you for all participants. Uh, I would like to remind you that we will be continuing this seminar series in the next season. And I have pasted the web, uh, the web page for the seminar series, series, and I encourage you to uh, watch out that web uh, page and register for um, the next seminar series uh, in, in, in September. Yeah, thank you, Kibro. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you bye, so much. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.